Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surprising greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him, his harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of crash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We praise with our lips, keeping our faults and failures locked safely away. In quieter memories, we acknowledge our deepest thoughts and face our pain. God of empty tombs and emptier people, you know our hearts and our intentions. When we find it difficult to love one another, forgive us and give us fresh compassion. When we want to stand with the high and mighty, forgive us. And when seat us next to the poor and compressed. When we stay locked behind our fears and doubts, forgive, forgive us. us. And send us. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John's gospel. You're welcome to read along with me. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Could we go back and look at the gospel again, please? No, that's fine. I want you to notice that in this gospel lesson, it begins right there in the second line. Those disciples are hiding away in a locked room scared to death. And then in the Acts passage that Karen read to us just a few minutes ago, it's only a few months later, but those same disciples 
are in the middle of the city of Jerusalem, probably right in the temple entrance, and they're drawing crowds. And Karen read, the high priest and the Sadducees were overcome with jealousy. As I read this week, I started to wonder, what is it that makes people who are hiding in fear in a locked room a few months later become the people who are causing a big disturbance in the middle of town? There were a couple things on my mind as I read and prepared this week. The first thing, of course, is what is it that God might be saying to First Presbyterian and to me as we join together for this time on our life journey? And then the second thing that was on my mind, every single day, loud voices and images from news of war and violence in Ukraine. So those two things were kind of overriding as I read the scriptures for the week. What is it that transformed those disciples from frightened, cowering people in John's gospel just a few months later, causing enough turmoil that lots of other people were joining them and they were upsetting the leaders? What is it today for people like us that can transform our concerns, our wondering about what's next, our fears and our worries? What transforms that into holy boldness? Well, the gospel lesson that we have here is pretty clear. Jesus came and stood among them. And Jesus said, Peace be with you. And when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Well, that's a pretty clear answer. Those fearful disciples become filled with joy. And so here's the challenge. When of us, any of us been so frightened, so upset that we hide. Now, maybe we don't literally hide, but maybe what we do is we put on a brave face in public and we pretend that everything is okay. Now, maybe that challenge, that concern came for you when there was a diagnosis, maybe something unexpected. Maybe that challenge comes for you and it sometimes comes for me when I realize I am totally out of sync with all the other people around me. What I'm thinking of and what I perceive as right isn't true for the rest of the people around me, even family sometimes. But maybe that challenge, that concern for you comes as you watch the news. Or horror of horrors as we try to deal with politics and our upcoming elections. But those disciples were so afraid for their lives that they hid behind a closed door. And then Jesus came through the door. So what is it the gospel saying to us today? It seems to me that the gospel is saying, stop pretending that everything's okay. Stop pretending that we can fix it by ignoring it. The gospel seems to tell us, instead, pay attention to what's going on and go deeply into those concerns. If you can even articulate or name what your concerns are. 
and stay with other people. Stay with your friends, stay with your community. Because that's how we're going to notice when Jesus shows up. In Acts 5, that Karen read for us, we read about those totally transformed disciples. They performed signs and wonders among the people, it said. And more and more people joined them. They brought people who needed healing in their bodies, healing of their minds, healing of their spirits. Now for the disciples, such boldness is a really risky thing. The powerful leaders, and it says Sadducees, the chief priests, the Sadducees, they felt threatened. And it says in a little more beyond what Karen read, they brought the disciples before the Jerusalem council. It actually says in Acts, the high priest demanded that they not teach in Jesus' name. And with holy boldness, Peter and the disciples said, we must obey God rather than people. Those frightened disciples who hid when they thought their leader was killed encountered the resurrected Jesus. And that's the challenge for us as we go forward. God is calling us to know that Jesus really is alive and Jesus is in the world today. For those first disciples and for us, knowing Jesus and experience that resurrection is what transformed their lives. That kind of transformation, that new life, can come to us as individuals and especially can come to us as a community here. Do we hear God saying to us here at First Presbyterian, stay together. Express your fears and concerns in this transition time and watch for presence of Jesus among us. The news is full of violence, destruction, threats from leaders who seem powerful in the world. The war in Ukraine is beginning its third month and around the world, people have been surprised by the resilience of the Ukrainian people. Where's that resilience coming from? Well, I learned this week that 70% of the Ukrainians identify as Orthodox Christians. And Orthodox Christianity has developed quite differently from the way our Western Christianity has developed. Now, one obvious difference is the day that we celebrate Easter. The date of Easter was set by the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. And Orthodox churches figure that date by the Julian calendar that was established by Julius Caesar in 46 BC. But the Western churches use the Gregorian calendar that was established by Pope Gregory in 1582. Now that's probably more information than you even really wanna know. We're just using two different calendars and that's why we celebrate on different Sundays. But perhaps even more important than the date is the way that the Western Church and the Orthodox Church practice their faith. Scholars have written that the Orthodox Church, even today, is probably much closer to that church in Acts, that early church that's in the New Testament, than we are here. In this morning's reading, the people gathered at Solomon's Gate, the Acts reading that Karen shared with us. 
they were reg re regularly gathering at Solomon's Gate. And that's one of the entrances to the temple at Jerusalem. So it means that they were coming together regularly, perhaps even daily, to pray together. And we're witnessing that same kind of solidarity in Ukraine because people are gathering in subway tunnels and in basement tunnels. The people are hanging together, watching out for one another. There's one more thing that we can learn by watching the Orthodox Christians in Ukraine who are celebrating Easter today. Here's a quote from Nicholas Sway. He's the director of the Orthodox Peace Fellowship. He wrote, the religious attitude toward death is essential to Orthodox Christianity. And he goes on to quote several of the hymn lyrics from the Orthodox Church. In the Orthodox Church, the hymns focus on how resurrection overcomes death. Now what they're talking about is that Easter is not just a salvation of our souls for some future time, but in fact, resurrection is about living a new way in the world today, right here and now. It's a life that's free from the worry of death. Now we know from studying history that our human experience is full of war and destruction. Individuals and nations have struggled and killed each other all through our human history. And that's what Paul in Romans calls the reign of death. Another Orthodox theologian, Reverend John Menendorf, he wrote this. On Pashka, that's an Armenian word that means Easter. On Pashka, we celebrate the end of this reign of death. Christ came to destroy it. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? The victory which our church celebrates so brilliant, I'm continuing the quote, the victory which our church, the Orthodox Church, celebrates so brilliantly, so loudly, so triumphantly is not simply a guarantee of an afterlife. Rather, it's a whole different set of priorities. There's no need for self-preservation anymore because our life is hidden in Christ. As we witness today what's happening in Ukraine, we're glimpsing people who have real concerns and real freedom from those concerns about dying. Horrific pictures on the news, you've seen them. But these are people whose hearts understand resurrection, maybe even in a way a little differently than we do. A couple short stories from very early in the war that I ran across this week. One story, within a day of the invasion, more, with more than 100 dead already, a woman in Ukraine approached a Russian soldier and offered him a gift of sunflower seeds. She said, you should put these in your pocket because if you die, flowers will grow up. In another case, a Ukrainian man approached a broken down Russian tray tank, and he joked with the soldiers, I could tow you back to Russia now if you'd like. Not only was the Ukrainian army resisting militarily, but civilians are saying no to the Russians. 
reign of death. They're saying it in small ways and nonviolent ways. That's the essence of Easter. Resurrection is about overcoming death and not living with that fear. This is a mystery and we don't fully understand it, but we can glimpse it. We can glimpse it in the gospel story. It has powerful implications for the life here at First Presbyterian and powerful implications for our individual lives. When the mystery of resurrection and the appearance of the living Christ comes to us, our way of living in the world will be changed and we become free, free to live with holy boldness we are resurrected and we are transformed. When we grasp the meaning of Easter, our way of living in the world is transformed. May it be so. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O oh God, you have in Jesus, in Jesus come to show us how to live your love in the world. Hear our prayers today of thanksgiving for the blessings that we enjoy. God of blessing and renewal, answer us with grace. We pray for others, for people and nations around the world, especially all whose lives are turned upside down by war and conflict. Open our hearts to see individuals as sisters and brothers who are loved by you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for people that we know, people who are sick, lonely, afraid, grieving, especially those who are on our prayer list this morning. May your hand touch them as we name them in our hearts, and may your love warm them. May your spirit Bring them new life. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Today we pray for this community of Lubbock, New people are arriving daily into all these new housing developments and apartment buildings and construction we see going up. We pray for our own family of First Presbyterian Church and for the session that you guide their conversation and their decisions. 
We pray for the pastoral nominating committee and for the person that you've already chosen to be their next pastor here. Gracious God, our parent, hear our prayers. We pray for those who have come before us and those who are yet to come. Trusting in your faithfulness, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trials, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As we enter into a time of offering ourselves to God, of giving thanks for the, all that God has already done, we'll begin with a mission moment, and Karen is going to offer that this morning. <clears throat> the word benediction comes from two Latin words that mean good word, bene and diction. So here's the good word for today. You are, in fact, Easter people. So go forth from this place as Easter people. Go forth knowing that Christ already lives in your heart. And this week, live your life so that others see Jesus in you. Go in the name of God, the Creator, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 